and joining you guys at a different time and different location than normal. Josh here on The Wrong Lead, joined as always by Mr. Andrew Champagne, doing a, another episode of Drank and Champagne. Andrew, how are you doing, my friend? Da, da, da. Yeah, um, Josh does not have his soundboard with him. He is on assignment in the middle of freaking nowhere. Having said that, it's a big week, obviously. The Kentucky Derby is upon us. We are recording this on Sunday night, so we're six days away from the run for the Roses and five days away from the Kentucky Oaks. If you're tuning in because it's the Kentucky Derby, the Kentucky Oaks, big week of racing, first of all, welcome. Thank you very much for spending part of your Derby week with us here on the On the Wrong Lead Network. If you like what we do, if you're on YouTube, go on down below, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, really helps us out. All those fun buttons down there that you see, we really appreciate it, and that gives us the ability to produce more shows like this in formats that hopefully our listeners appreciate. So we've got a lot of fun things planned for this show. Uh there's, it's impossible not to have fun, really, with such a smorgasbord of racing coming up this week at Churchill Downs. There's a lot going on with the Tuesday and Thursday programs. There's also, though, the Kentucky Oaks Day program on Friday and the Kentucky Derby program on Saturday. We'll talk about the big races for sure, but we'll also go through some of the races on the undercard with our best bets and live long shots and hopefully be able to give you something you can use to make some money on a big day. Um, Andrew, I believe it's called 5-0 Tuesday. Uh, okay, fine. That's fine by me. You can call it whatever you want. I'll call it the Thursday before the Kentucky Derby. No, just like Derby. Yeah, I'll call it the Tuesday and Thursday before the Kentucky Derby. Thank you. Freedom of speech, Josh. I know my rights. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is, uh, is going to be a little bit different show than I think uh, we're, we're normally used to just because a – I'm in a hotel room, uh, and uh, B, um, you know, I'm working off a laptop. So normally I have a bunch of screens and other stuff to, to mess around here, but, uh, you know, we want to make sure we got some content out for, obviously, the, in, in my opinion, the biggest day of racing of the year. Um, sorry, Breeders' Cup. Um, but um, I think I think at least for the, the lay people out there, right, the, the non-regular fans, the, the Kentucky Derby is it, but... Uh, I, I did want to. We'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll just jump right in, Andrew. Um, we're gonna go kind of go through our normal format: best bet, long shot, bold prediction for each day, and uh, have a couple different thoughts here for for each of them. Um, I didn't really touch. Well, I, I my best bet is in the Oaks, but uh, none of. And I guess my bold prediction is in the Derby, but um, it's. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I kind of, I, I thought actually I was going to avoid the big races, but, uh, you know, I, I ended up kind of jumping right in. But, uh, Andrew, you're going to start us off with a pretty early race here in uh, race six in the unbridled Sydney Stakes. Yep, this is Friday's card. So Friday, May 3rd, I will focus on race number six, the unbridled Sydney, four fillies and mares going five and a half furlongs on the new Churchill Downs turf course. Seen a couple of races on it. I'm cautiously optimistic. Churchill's recent track record with regard to growing grass, not great. On Saturday night, though, the turf course looked pretty good. I hope it holds up. Of course, it looked pretty good for a little while last year, and then shit hit the fan. <laughs> Having said that, though, I am going to the far outside in this turf sprint, and I am focusing very heavily on horse number 10, Tony Ann. Tony Ann last year quietly had a pretty darn good year for trainer Phil D'Amato out on the West Coast, shipped over to Kentucky for a couple of runs, was third in a grade two at Kentucky Downs before capturing the grade two Franklin at Keeneland, winning that race by a neck over a horse Josh that some people out there have probably heard of, and that's Caravel. Granted, Caravel was a bit past her peak at that point, but she was still capable of running pretty big races. They ran this horse in the Breeders' Cup turf sprint against the boys, and No Balls just was not coming back to the rest of the field on that particular occasion. Plus, even though she has a win going five furlongs on the resume, I think that's a little bit shorter than she wants. I think she's a five and a half furlong horse. She has not run since the Breeders' Cup, and Josh, that's something I noticed that we can talk about as we go through. There are a lot of horses coming 
coming back on the Oaks and Derby Day programs off of long layoffs. And that had been something that I had sort of seen before, but this is new in how many horses are doing that. Tony Ann, though, has been working very consistently over at Keeneland. I am not concerned with the layoff. Flavian Pratt sees fit to ride. And I love the post position because he can play the break from there. There's a lot of early speed in a five and a half furlong turf sprint because, hey, it's a five and a half furlong turf mm-hmm. sprint. You're going to get some early speed horses here. Tony Ann has shown that she can sit in that second or third flight and come running. I think that's the winning trip in this particular spot. And Josh, I really hope we get that eight to one morning line price come post time for the unbridled Sydney on Friday afternoon. Yeah, I, I had a slightly different opinion than you on that race. I, I did think that the, um, the morning line favorite, the two overcharged, looked pretty tough in that spot. But um, I, I don't, I don't hate the pick of the ten. I think if if there does, uh, if it does end up getting, um, you know, a little a little crazy up front, um, I, I do think that you're you're going to get um, a bit of uh, you're going to get a, a horse that's going to get a nice trip. Right. And is going to be able to, you, you know, he's going to be able to kind of shift over with all that speed uh, in front of it or horses a little bit more forwardly placed. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't hate it. Eight to one, great price. Um, you know, I, I went to the big race here um, and, and I went straight to the Kentucky Oaks. And, you know, I, I don't have a super strong opinion yet of the Derby, um, but the Oaks, I, I think. I know where I want most of my money to go through. Um, and that's going to be on the, I, I, I kept, when when doing this, I kept on mixing up the numbers in this race. So, and like I said, I'm working off one screen, so I'm like going back and forth, but that's the 11 ways and means, um, five to one on the morning line. And, you know, there, you looking at this race, right? You you have some horses that ha- have someone won some really nice races. Obviously, um, the, the uh, thirteen just FYI in here uh, who won the the juvenile fillies and then came back to run uh, you know a solid second in the Ashland. Um, and you know I I was just kind of looking through some of these horses and the one horse in this race that I can say for sure that we haven't seen their best yet really feels like the 11 ways and means. Um, obviously it was an impressive maiden winner, uh, won by 12 lengths, um, came right back in the spin away, you know, came from pretty far off of it, uh, for a seven furlong sprint and, uh, you know, ended up finishing second by half length, came back in the GP Oaks, uh, this year and, uh, finished second. Um, but, if you kind of look through the notes and, and you watch the replays of some of these races, I still think Ways and Means is, is a bit of a green horse and just, I mean, has not gotten a clean trip at all in, in her three starts. And, you know, I, I know there's the, the, the Tacitists of, of the world, right, that just make their own trouble every single start. But I don't know. I, I think that, that this is less finding trouble all the time and more just I think uh, just green greenness um, and if you've if you've watched any works or heard any of the works this looks like a horse that's working very very well in the morning um, news alert every horse is working very well in the morning and but- every trainer wouldn't trade places <laughs> with anybody seriously folks don't listen too much to trainer speak this week yeah but um, yeah I don't know I, I think that um, five to one's at really square price. Um, I, I know you have a thought on this race a little bit later and I agree. Um, I agree somewhat with your thought. Um, but yeah, I, I just thought that this was the spot. Um, this is a good spot. You're going to get a nice price uh, at five to one. And, um, yeah, I, I think this is where I'm gonna have all my money in, uh, on, on the Kentucky Oaks. Ways and means is very clearly a very hard horse to ride because in all three of her starts, she has found trouble somewhere. I have seen these starts and it's not the kind of trouble that, oh, I don't know if this is as bad as it looks. It's bad. It's dreadful, especially the last two starts. This is a horse that damn near went down two starts ago in the grade one spin away, still managed to run second by a horse named Brightwork, who was going very well at the time. They gave this horse time off, came back in the Gulfstream Park Oaks, 
steadied going into the first turn, had to rush up, and didn't have anything left when Power Squeeze, who I think is a pretty nice horse, came up to challenge in that short stretch going a mile and a 16th. If Ways and Means gets a clean trip, I think she's tough. The problem is, I think she does make her own trouble, and I think that's evident in the workout that she had earlier this week at Churchill Downs, where she went four furlongs in 46 and one. Chad Brown was not happy. He said, yeah, she went too fast. You don't want something like that going wrong. And it would be a little bit different if it was, say, oh, I wanted 47 and three, and he went 47 and one. This is 46 and one. This is not an easy horse to ride. I have to think that's part of the reason that neither Flavian Pratt nor Irad Ortiz are still on this horse. Ways and Means could absolutely win the Kentucky Oaks. At 5-1, to one, that hits me as a fair price. What I'm concerned about is her potentially being the wise guy horse and coming down to that 3-1, to 7-2 to range because of the connections, because of the trouble. If that happens, I think she's an underlay. If she's five to one or so, though, I think that's fair. And I've got nothing against you liking the horse. It's all about finding your price in that particular race. And I do think we're going to get some value there because I hate one of the horses that's going to take money. That's called foreshadowing, kids. <laughs> well, let's um, <clears throat> let's talk about a horse that you do like. Yes. In the race right after the Kentucky Oaks. And yes, there are two of them. Friday's card has 13 races. Be prepared. This is a really thick batch of past performances I'm holding in my hands, folks. If you're going to handicap Friday and Saturday, dedicate some time to it. So race number 12 is an optional claiming event for horses going six and a half furlongs. These are three-year-old fillies, and there are some well-met horses in this bunch, a bunch that includes number six, Minx Palace. Minx Palace did something that I really like seeing debuting horses do. She closed and she won. That is not easy for a first-time starter to do. Horses are herd animals, and generally speaking, in those first-time-out races, you want to be on or near the lead. This was a horse that was five lengths back at the first point of call, yes, got some help from a fast pace, but rallied beneath Luis Saez, won by more than a length, and that day's second place finisher was a horse named Lemon Muffin, who's going to be contesting the Kentucky Oaks. She's not going to be one of the favorites, but she is a nice horse. We have not seen Minx Palace since that November 2nd race, but she has been working lights out at Keeneland for trainer Eddie Keneally, who knows how to win with comebacking horses. He's also 24% with horses getting first time Lasix. And Luis Saez, who probably had some options, decides to stay aboard. There's every chance Minx Palace needs a race. But if she's right, I think she's a very nice horse. And 15 to 1 seems about twice the price she should be. I will gladly take a swing at or near that number on a horse that I think has some talent, that has the pedigree to get better as she gets older. There's every chance, Josh, that she's better now than she was on November 2nd. And if she is, I think we've got a very nice horse on our hands. One that if she wins, you're not going to get 15 to one on again anytime soon. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> uh, I did not look at races 12 or 13. So I, I can't I, blame you. I, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, there's only so much you can expect certain people to do, especially when they're traveling like you are. I get it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I did look at a uh, turf race, and uh, it, it's a race right before the Oaks. And uh, shout out to our friend Matthew DeSantis, because I believe when you had mentioned in our group chat that uh, that we were going to look at uh, we were going to look at this race. Uh, what did what did Matthew say? Um, I believe he said something about the letter E and the number eight. Yes, and if you look at race number ten, uh, I believe we do have. An yep. E8, uh, and that is going to be your number one pink polka dots. And um, you know, Andrew, this is uh, this is this is maybe one of one of your callbacks, right? This is one of your moves, Andrew? Put a line through that last race at Turfway Park. What do you see? 
I see a horse that has never been trailing at any point of call in any prior turf race. <laughs> and obviously, this horse was, was very well bet in that Bourbon Nut Oaks uh, at Turfway Park. Um, but, you know, we, we often talk about um, turf horses and synthetic kind of being... Uh, interchangeable bit, but it, it's its own surface, right? And sometimes horses just do not get that surface. And when I look at this horse, I see Candy Ride on the top. I see Dynaformer on the bottom. This is a horse that obviously, obviously has loved the distance, has got two wins going a mile and 16th on the turf, wire to wire, and is going from the, the rubber to to the, the, the green stuff again. Um, and you get Tyler Gaffley on a board who rides very very well here in Kentucky um, and I, I just think this is a great fit this is a horse that is not going to be that bet because they're going to see that last race and they're going to be like oh when this horse faced other good horses it just didn't run well but I think you I'm going to attribute it more to the actual surface versus uh, any any problem with the horse and when you kind of take a look at this race I mean Outside of maybe the seven, this race is pretty devoid of speed. Obviously, the seven Max Superfly um, has shown some speed, but this is a horse once again that's only run on the synthetic or dirt. Um, and once again, this is going to be a this is a different surface. So who knows if this horse is going to show that kind of speed? So I, I really, I really think Pink Polka Dots here is going to be a bit of an overlay, twenty to one in the morning line, and. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, give me all of it. I'm not going to talk you off the 20 to 1 that Pink Polka Dots is. I would like this horse a lot more if this horse was allowed to run on Lasix. That's the one concern that I have. You're getting 20 to 1. I think that's fair because if it turned out that she just didn't like the synthetic, she could absolutely run well here. What I'm more concerned about is... She was going pretty well early on in the Bourbonette Oaks, and she spat the bit. I don't know if that's I hate synthetic or if it's I need Lasix. That's the question that I think you need to answer, but that's why you're getting 20 to 1 on this horse. It, and if this horse turns out to run really, really well, then yeah, it's absolutely a bargain there. Personally, I think hard to justify is going to be very tough to beat in there. I think there's a little bit more speed in that race uh, than maybe it looks at first glance. I think number six pounds has to go early. I think hard to justify is going to at the very least be up close, but somebody has to run second if you like hard to justify. And I can't argue with anybody that wants to use pink polka dots underneath at a price. Let's move on here to the, your Kentucky Oaks prediction, your Friday bold prediction. Tarifa doesn't hit the board in the Kentucky Oaks. Tarifa is your morning line favorite for the Kentucky Oaks on Friday afternoon slash early evening, depending on where you are. She leads the Kentucky Oaks leaderboard in points off of wins at the fairgrounds. I didn't love either of those races. I thought she got two perfect trips against fields that were nothing special in any way, shape, or form. Both of those graded stakes wins came against five opponents apiece. It, to me, it just looks like, can she run well? Sure. But even if she runs well, there's no guarantee that type of effort is going to be enough against the likes of Torpedo Anna, Just FYI, Leslie's Rose, Ways and Means if she gets a trip. I think Tarifa is going to take a lot of money and I will not have her on any of my tickets. Not to say she cannot run well. I'd be shocked if she won. I don't think she hits the board in this particular spot solely because she's finally facing three-year-old fillies that are better than she is. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you. I, I, I don't think she goes off as your favorite. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. And really quick, just to add something to that, if Where's My Ring runs back to the Gazelle, she could absolutely finish second or third at a big price. It's just we don't think she beat a whole lot in the Gazelle. Yeah. Aqueduct surface is sort of quirky. But figures-wise, she fits too. I think there's a lot better bets you can make in the Kentucky Oaks 
than Tarifa, who's your 7-2 to morning line favorite. I don't know if she'll go off favorite or not, but she's going to be one of the favorites. It's a very good betting race. Yeah, I, I could see maybe, um, was it just FYI, um, maybe going off as your favorite? I know she finished... Uh, you know, she finished, was it second? She uh, was second in the Ashland, yes, but she had a really strange trip, and that was her first race in five months. Uh, recent workouts look pretty good. She's my top pick in there, even with the 13 post, which isn't ideal. But going a mile and an eighth, there's at least a little bit of a run into that first turn, and she's got some tactical speed. I think she'll be okay. Yeah, and I kind of leaned into a little bit of what you kind of said Um and, you know, I was looking at the pick five, the late the entire pick five that ends in the Oaks. And in my mind, every single favorite in those races looked vulnerable. Um, and I was going to say every favorite loses, but we all know that, you know, morning lines don't really mean anything. So um, in this case, I decided to say no morning line favorite wins in the pick five ending in the Oaks. Um I know. I, was it hard to justify? Uh, I know you like that horse. I believe that horse is the morning yep. line favorite. Um, that that one, I kind of went back and forth on. There was another one that another horse in there that, that kind of looked good, but I, I don't know. I I think that this this late pick five is going to pay. It's going to pay very well. Um, so of course it's going to go for five straight favorites and and not pay. But um, I, I definitely think that th- there's going to be a very very nice wagering opportunity in this pick five on Friday. It very well could be. I thought Friday's races, by and large, were a little bit more wide open than Saturday's races. And that's nothing against Saturday's races. I think there are plenty of wagering opportunities. In fact, the three races that I'm going to talk about with my best bet, live long shot, bold prediction, they're back to back to back. So if I'm right with all three of those, I'm going to have a very good day. Do you want to talk about the Derby first before we go into the best bet live long shot bold prediction, just to give the people what they want? Uh, sure. Do you want to start with our bold predictions since they, uh, they both involve the Derby. That's a good idea. Um, so look, a, do you, okay. I'll, I'll go first here. So if you're going to make money playing the Kentucky Derby, You need to take a stand against one of the two favorites. I will not take a stand against fierceness for reasons that I will outline after Josh gives his bold prediction, because I have a sneaking feeling. I know what it is. Yep. So (laughs) I I figured that. So for those listening on the podcast, my bold prediction is neither Sierra Leone or fierceness wins the Derby, but uh, back to you, Andrew. Sure. So I'm not taking a stand against fierceness and I can explain why after Josh goes into his bold prediction, because I have a feeling I know where he's going with that, but I will take a stand against Sierra Leone. The post position draw this year mattered for a number of horses. It mattered for fierceness who got a great draw towards the outside and could get the big Brown trip. Sierra Leone is a deep closer. We know he's a head case from what he displayed in the bluegrass and the fact that during several of his runs, he's lugged in very, very badly. He could win. He has the talent to win this race. I believe the risen star was the most productive Kentucky Derby prep on the entire schedule. The top five finishers from that race all made the Kentucky Derby field. That's kind of amazing. When you think about it, if Sierra Leone was eight to one, I wouldn't be as staunchly against Sierra Leone as I am. At three to one on the morning line, anywhere close to that, I can't play this horse. Domestic product, however, I find very interesting. The two races that he's run this year, he has had no pace to chase. And he is a dyed-in-the-wool closer that wants a pace to sit behind and will make one run. In those two races, he was second in the grade three Holy Bull and was the only horse doing any running late in that short stretch going a mile and a 16th at Gulfstream Park. And Josh, who ran third that day? Fierceness. Yep. We forget that because everyone's drawing a line through Fierceness's dud in that race because that wasn't the real Fierceness. Copyright Pete Aiello with a nod to Dave Rodman. All rights reserved. (laughs) <laughs> but domestic product running second in that race is going completely ignored. And I thought he ran very well that day. I also thought he ran well in the Tampa Bay Derby. 
And I think we as handicappers are ignoring that race because we couldn't bet on it. That was the day of the gigantic tote fiasco. And yes, folks, it was a tote fiasco. We bet through the tote. We couldn't use the tote. It was a tote outage. Let's be real. Anyway, I think domestic product for the first time in forever gets a pace to sit behind beneath Irad Ortiz Jr., one of the best riders in the game, who's going to give him every chance to make a run. Do I think domestic product wins? No. Do I think domestic product could well run second? Absolutely. And at that kind of a price, I think that's a horse you want to be using in your exotics versus a horse like Sierra Leone. And hey, if you hate fierceness, take the same general strategy. Because if you're playing a whole bunch of exactas and one of them is Sierra Leone fierceness or fierceness Sierra Leone, that's not sound betting strategy because that exact is not going to pay anything and you're just throwing money at combinations. Take a stand against one of those two horses at least and you could stand to make some money. And Josh, I disagree with you, but I like where your head's at. Yeah. Um, so I, I laugh a little bit because I, I have, I have, I just have a different opinion uh, on this than, than you do. Um, so I think Sierra Leone is probably out of all the horses in the race that I think is most likely to finish third or better. I I just think that the, the way that that horse runs, um, that horse clunking up for third is like almost a guarantee and, and winning the race, you know, depends on, on a couple of other things. Um, my, my biggest issue with Sierra Leone is I think what you had kind of mentioned the price. I mean, if Sierra Leone is going to be three to one horizontally I'll use, but from a single race standpoint or trying to build a, um, well, maybe not, maybe not a super effective just because how inefficient that pool is. But from a single race like win bet, Sierra Leone is just not touchable. Um, I, I have concerns about fierceness. Um, you know, I think I joked with you, but earlier about the post position and how I have data. Shot. I have data here, by I, the way. That's we not, want to address not, that. That's not. I I have no issues with with the post. Like I said, it's a different gate and all that. Yeah. All that's different. Also, very quickly, if you do have issues with the post, I'm not going to go through it on the podcast. Look up Joaquin Jaime from FanDuel Racing on Twitter. He has laid out the horses that have broken from post 17 and their respective odds. It's worth a look. Um, But when I look at this race and I think about the last couple years, um, and it's a 20 horse race. It's a very weirdly run race. I just see there being a ton of speed in here. And I know that fierceness has tried to rate, but, and, and I mean, the juvenile, you know, he set second, and, but that pace, I mean, it was okay, but they went, they went 24 in that second, that second quarter. So it, it definitely slowed down a bit there. I'm just a little concerned that he's been on the lead in relatively easy paces, and that's when he's won. And when he's, if he's going to be on the lead or close to it with a hot pace, I just have concerns pace wise with that. And so, you know, I, my eyes kind of go to, um, you know, I mean, they should it, my eyes should go to Sierra Leone because obviously uh, the bluegrass was uh, was a pretty fast pace and you know Sierra Leone you know just absolutely closed into that one, but two other horses that uh, my eyes kind of go to um, the four catching freedom for, uh-huh. for Brad Cox I think that um, he might get a little lost on the board um, I know um, you know he's eight to one in the morning line but I, I do think that these other two horses could take just a, a crap ton of money. Or I could also see the fact that people are going to look at this horse and be like, this is the third choice. This is the third option. And maybe he gets bet down a little bit more than that. But I, I just thought catching freedom's run style really, really fits in with, with what's going to happen here pace wise. And then 
probably the horse that everybody's talking about. And I hate, I hate that I might be on the wise guy horse. But the seven honor Marie, I think, also ran a really good race last time out in the Louisiana Derby. And I know everyone's talking about that work. Um, I'm just looking at the price. And if that's the wise guy horse and everybody knows someone named Marie and that horse goes off at eight to one, like, uh, like my boy Jack, then I don't want to touch you the 10 foot pole <laughs> at the morning line horse makes a lot of sense, uh, that as a type of horse I'd like to play. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, I just think pace wise, it's going to be tough to take anyone on the front end. You know, I, I had gone through a bunch of these horses, tried to make a case for them. Like for a while, I thought that maybe track phantom would be interesting because he's ran a couple of stinkers. E8. E8. Well, I thought that he's run a couple of stinkers. Like, you know, he's going to be out of everybody's uh, mind. And, and maybe if he shows up with his A effort, like it's enough to win here. But there's there's just no way that he's going to be able to get on the lead um, and, and run any type of fraction that I think he's going to be able to, to stay on with. So um, I, I had a hard time sticking with any of the um, the speed horses here. And I went with, I got, the, I got two closers, I think, that are going to be an okay price. And... I mean, I say Sierra Leone doesn't win the Derby, but you know, maybe, maybe I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fishing for for clicks a little bit. But that's why I, we call it a bold prediction, though. I like know. that's the thing. If we're right, it's a really, really good call that nobody's going to be taking. I'm yeah. going to counterpoint you on a couple of fierceness things mm -hmm. because there's a lot that's being made about how fierceness hasn't passed horses. Fierceness hasn't passed horses. Fierceness hasn't passed horses. Hi, Mark Capitan. How you doing? <laughs> Here's a stat that I think is very relevant. And I know speed figures aren't everything. They're a tool in a toolbox, right? But there are two speed figures in this race of all of the horses that have run any sort of races where the horse in question has earned a Briz speed figure of 105 or greater. Fierceness has both of them. Yes, a Mark Stray alert down there on the bottom. We don't have the soundboard, so we're going to need to improvise. <laughs> um, fierceness has two. The rest of the field has zero. Fierceness has three races in which he has run a triple digit Briz speed figure, 100 or greater. The rest of the field... 21 other horses, counting the also eligibles, have combined for six. You don't need to pass other horses if you're naturally faster than all of them. And I keep coming back to this point that I've been mulling over for several weeks now, which is if Fierceness runs his A race, who beats him? And Josh, I know you had mentioned jokingly someone running their S race. <laughs> I'm looking at this field with the possible, and I mean possible exception of catching freedom, who finally caught a clean trip last time out in the Louisiana Derby. I don't know if any other horse's S race is enough. With that in mind, fierceness is going to be a single on every one of my tickets. I could not in good conscience, though, give you fierceness, a five to two morning line favorite in the Kentucky Derby as my best bet of the Saturday card. I wanted to go hunting for some value. And with that, we are going to start by looking at race number 10, the race, two races before the Kentucky Derby, the grade one. And I use that term very loosely, Churchill down stakes, how this race is a grade one and the cigar mile is a grade two. I don't know. To me, they're pretty much the same race that attracts pretty much the same kind of feel. Are you not a big fan of Mr. Wireless? Um, No. No, I'm not. <laughs> what I am a fan of, though, is Lone Speed. And I think Hoist the Gold is absolutely the Lone Speed in this year's Churchill Down Stakes. Breaking from the far outside, which is a fantastic post, he's not going to have to worry about any traffic at all whatsoever. I'm drawing a big old line through the Saudi cup. You ship a horse halfway across the world. Weird things are sometimes going to happen. I'm drawing a line straight through that. This horse wants seven furlongs to a mile, one turn. He gets that route here and he gets that route 
as the seven to two second choice on the morning line. Your morning line favorite is horse number six, Zozos, a horse that I liked a bit last time out in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, which Josh was won by. Which horse? Um, Sizz-wiz? Um, Cody's Wish would be the name of that horse. I was no, trying to give you a nice little layup there, but you know, you know it's I don't okay. Want to say that name. You are car lagged after driving to the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I understand that. The thing with Zozos is, I think seven furlongs is a little bit too short for him. For one, for another, looking at the work tab, this horse was off the tab completely from the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile to March 29th. This horse has five workouts leading up to this race that he comes back in on the Kentucky Derby Day undercard. I think this is a prep. I think they're thinking, okay, this is a million dollar race. There aren't any monsters out there. Let's enter. Let's take our shot. If he winds up winning, that's great. If not, it's not the end of the world. I think Zozos will go favored because of the Brad Cox connection and because Hoist the Gold comes in off of such a terrible effort in Saudi Arabia. Hoist the Gold, to me, hits me as the lone speed in this race. I think leads them at every point of call beneath John Velasquez. That's my best bet of the day. He's going to be a single for me in a lot of those multi-race exotics. I think he leads from flag fall to that's all. And hey, early speed on the Derby Day undercard, that's not a bad thing. Yeah, um, I looked at this race a little bit. Um, I have a hard time trusting Hoist the Gold with uh, coming back from Saudi. We, um, we we share that because I feel like Hoist the Gold either wins by five or he's 12th beaten 20 and there's no middle ground. And I understand that there are only 11 horses in the field. I still think he's 12th beaten 20. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually kind of like Tejano Twist in this spot. But I think he's going to have a lot to do. But he does seem to like Churchill Downs a little bit. Uh, he does have uh, two wins uh, here at Churchill. I mean, obviously, it's in 10 starts. But I kind of feel like he's he's kind of become a different horse after turning four. Um, and, and has really kind of, you know, he's he started churning out a couple wins. He had three wins last year. Um, winless this year, but he's got three seconds. Um, so I, I just think that he's, a, uh, he's an interesting horse. And, like, when I look at the horses that beat Tejano Twist, I think those horses would be five to two, two to one in this race. And I'm talking about Skelly and Jackson Traveler. Um, I, I think that those horses would would, I mean, they would be super short in a race like this. So yeah, um, Tejano Twist would actually be my second choice in the race. My concern with him is I think he's a better six furlong horse than a seven furlong horse. I think enough. he's a drop back, make one run sort of thing. And I think seven furlongs might be just a bit further than he wants to go. He finished third in this race last year. Hoist the Gold actually beat him home that day. Cody's Wish was a city block ahead of both of them. But that's not a totally illogical thing. The only issue with that is who goes with hoist the gold i don't know if anyone does and if hoist the gold gets comfortable like if you see 22 and 4 45 and 3 probably gone so andrew um we we there's a line that you love to say right that you know we've watched a ton of races and when we see races differently like that, that's what makes the game great, right? Sure. You know, we see now we've seen a ton of races and we see the race exactly the same. Is that like, do you think that we might be in trouble? D- does this involve uh, the letter E and the number eight by any chance? It yep. absolutely does. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> look at I had this horse. I, I love this horse so much, and I bet this horse every single time he runs. And I'm talking about number eight, never surprised in the Turf Classic race 11. Um, and by God, one of these times he's going to get there, and I'm going to have him. Um, you know, I mean, we're going back to the the Pegasus uh, turf uh, when Colonel Liam held him off, and the subsequent tur- races. You know, I bet him, bet him, bet him. Um, and I just think that he's, I think, I mean, he's going to get loose once again here. You know, I, you get flow aboard 
I really wish that it was, you know, Saez, but, you know, the, there is just absolutely no speed in this race. And I feel like I say that every time he runs, but there really is no speed in here. And I just think that he gets out there and gets loose. And, you know, we'll see how this turf course is playing. Nobody knows how this turf is going to end up because the last couple of years with them ripping it out, putting it back in, and it's just been a weird, weird turf course. Hopefully with a couple of years under it now, like, like you said on Saturday, the turf course looked good. Um, so let's hope it holds up this week and, and we'll see what we see get here. But I mean, this just seems like this just seems like the quintessential loan speed. Um, and like, I know he got that two back, um, but you know, he finished second by a nose. He almost did it. You know, maybe, maybe we get, uh, maybe we get him to hold on this time. Yep. And, uh, the reason Josh mentioned us agreeing on a race, which very rarely happens. And it's why this show is a lot of fun is that's my Saturday long shot. Never surprised. And first of all, I think we're going to get the 10 to one on this horse, but I think the morning line is absolutely dreadful there. If number six, I'm very busy winds up going off favored over horses like integration and program trading, uh, enable power, by the way, sorry about that is actually the morning line favorite, but I'm very busy, very close behind at four to one. That's wrong. I'm very busy, ran one big race at fairgrounds on Lasix which he doesn't get here. I think that one drifts up. I think integration and program trading come down a couple of ticks. And I think those two and Naval Power wind up being the three favorites with I'm very busy and never surprised, fairly close in the wagering. I don't know if never surprised is the loan speed, but I think never surprised is the main speed. I think Cellist has some early speed, even though I think he probably wants a little bit longer than a mile and an eighth. The wild card to me would be number five program trading who has gone to the front in a couple of his prior starts from the middle of his three-year-old year. He won the Saratoga Derby that way, going close to wire to wire when he re-rallied over yielding turf. I don't think position A for him is the front, but I also wouldn't be surprised if he shows a little bit of early interest, but never surprised is absolutely a must use if you subscribe to the notion that pace makes the race. Yeah. And honestly, um, going into my long shot, uh, you know, we, we kind of come to a, a similar situation, I think in uh, race seven, the distaff turf mile, um, I, maybe, maybe there's a little bit more pace in this race. I, I think you got uh, like Heavenly Sunday and Delahaye. You know, Walkathon can go too. Um, but you know, I see Luis Saez getting onto a turf horse that wants to be on the front. I see a horse that has run his best race going a mile and is cutting back from going slightly longer. I, I mean. Not so close. Another uh, E8. Um, you know, I know last time out, uh, he finished third to, to Delahaye and, and I think joined the dance. Um, and But the way he kind of kept on in that race was just a little bit different than he had been running the last couple races. Uh, he had, you know, a soft ground at Fairgrounds time before. Maybe he just didn't like the cut in the ground. But, you know, he had, he basically quit in that race and the race before he'd kind of quit once again. But if you look at the notes, he really like dug in and, and, and really, really just fought and, and, and kind of stuck in there. And when you see this horse is now that type of horse is cutting back. Uh, I think maybe the horse is going to have enough in the tank to, to hang on, on the front end in this time. And you go back to that, that Saratoga race four back. I mean, that's exactly what happened. Uh, you know, Ricky Santana got that horse on the front end and he held on, uh, and won by, uh, by three quarters of a length. So, um, I think the cutback's going to help here. I think the rider switch, um, you, you get the best front end turf rider in the country. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think there's a, there's a lot of signs pointing up and then you see 20 to one in the morning line. Like I'm absolutely taking a shot here with not so close. 
So I get that for sure. I think there's more speed in the race. I think there are horses that are going to go early. I actually really like the horse. A couple of stalls outside of that one, number 11, Cop Ice, who is five to one on the morning line. And my guess is that one's coming down. Mm -hmm. This is a Chad Brown trained runner with Frankie Dettori aboard the Judd Montselks that we've seen very often. And she's making her first start in the U S after a very good European campaign last year that saw her run up against the likes of Inspiro and Nashua. If Inspiral or Nashua showed up in this particular field, they'd be one to five. And for very good reason, the post position, a little bit of a concern, but I think that one is clearly the most likely winner of that particular race. But Hey, I'm not going to talk you off a 20 to one shot, especially when it's a speed horse ridden by Luis Saez, one of the best gate riders in the game. And Hey, even if I like cop ice as much as I do, somebody has got to run second. Yep. Andrew, that might have been record time for us to get through uh, get through all of our uh, topics for the week. And we only made it through with one stray at Mark Capitan. Under betters, collect your money. Yep. Uh, clapping, 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 clapping. Yeah, I wish I had my soundboard, but but this honestly, is just like one of those cheap 1930s radio broadcasts where they had like instructions written in the <laughs> script, and we're reading them out as we go. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I just wanted to make sure that we got content out for you guys. Um, of course. And um, yeah, we'll have our live streams on uh, on Thursday and Friday uh, as our normal times. Um, and, you know, I, I'll be doing stuff. I think I'm doing something with Gino this week. Um, and uh, we, we got some some other fun stuff possibly might be happening. So so stay tuned. Um, obviously, on the wrong lead dot com at wrong underscore lead. Bum, bum, ba -da -dum, bum, 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 <laughs> really quick plug before we wind up uh, bidding you adieu. Winnersandwiners.com will have Kentucky Derby content up all week, including some promos from online race books that you're not going to want to miss. If you haven't for some reason set up an account on a couple of these race books, you're going to want to pay attention. No better time than now to sign up. So keep an eye out. Cool. Well, it's going to do it for us. Catch you guys later. <laughs>